All right, everyone, good evening. I'm Dr. Alex Hollingshead from the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho, not Moscow, Russia. Um, and welcome to our monthly UDL IRN Network and Learn series. Today we'll be talking about the UDL research base, uh, current trends and implications. Uh, so we have some wonderful presenters today. Uh, we have Dr. Kavita Rao from University of Hawaii, Dr. Alisa Lowry from University of Southern Mississippi, Dr. Sean Smith from the University of Kansas, Dr. Jim Gardner from University of Oklahoma, and Dr. Brian Wojcik from University of Nebraska in Kearney. There's uh, a couple opportunities for you to actively participate in tonight's session. Um, you are obviously listening to the webinar, but you can also share your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions about uh, UDL-related research um, in, in inputting your ideas into the Google document. Uh, you have a link here as well as QR code if that's easier for you to scan um, during this webinar right now. And you all were sent the, a link to this Google document prior to the session. And later on, we'll hear more about the document and how to utilize it. So another opportunity to participate is via Twitter. Uh, to follow this conversation, you would use hashtag UDLIRN. So you can post your questions, your comments right there. And, um, and without further ado, welcome to our session, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Smith. Uh, I'm a, a, a member and the committee chair of the UDL IRN uh, Research Committee, the core committee. And the rest of the facilitators this evening are members of that core committee. Uh, and tonight we'll kind of facilitate uh, a process that if uh, Alex you could go to the next screen please we'll facilitate a process where we'll review the summit conversation from uh, the summit that took place back in March of this year in Baltimore we want to introduce a research database tool based on some of our core work and then an open discussion about the R and IRN and before we go any further I do want to clarify the um, the core committee we meet regularly uh, this is an activity where we're trying to go beyond that core committee to a broader group within the IRN as well as, of course, others uh, within this specific area of research, and we'll have more on that as we go forward. Alisa? Coming, unmuting. So um, one of the things, as Alex mentioned earlier, that we'd like for you to do tonight uh, is we'd really like your input. We like to... Uh, tailor what we're doing to the needs of the users and we want to um, include some design aspects as we're planning what we're going to do for the summit so your input would be very helpful we have set up a document uh, where you can share your ideas your questions really anything you want to share and the presenters have already gone ahead and modeled for you kind of the things that we're looking for of course you can go beyond that if you choose you can share as as much or as little as you like um, it's an active document. It will stay live so you can present during or after. And as I said, we will use this as we're planning our sessions for this summit, but also some of our research activities moving forward. Additionally, we hope it allows you to network with others who have interests um, that who share similar interests. And in, uh, I believe someone's going to speak more to other networking tools that we may offer later tonight. Well, great. Well, folks, we're just excited uh, as, uh, you know, the, the, the IRN has done a, a great deal, like a number of activities. Uh, a number of them, some of us may see as uh, more implementation, but we as a research core committee have seen a lot of our aspects in terms of the research elements as well. But tonight we wanted to focus in on that uh, aspect directly. And we wanted to begin with kind of reflecting from some activities that took place, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, back March 16th and 17th in Baltimore at the second, uh, wait, the third summit, I think it was, um, for the UDL IRN. We had two sessions that uh, actually were separated by lunch. And the first session, we had a number of individuals, participants, and everyone from K-12 to institutions of higher education to practitioners in the field to um, uh, researchers to folks affiliated with different types of entities, be it state agencies or provincial agencies. And in that, we tried to facilitate a conversation that ranged from everything from uh, issues about uh, what questions individuals are asking to the types of research that is currently going on. 
to uh, studies that currently have been uh, identified, collected, and what the, the current research trend was actually sharing. Uh, and also, basically almost anything in between. And we facilitated it, like I said, prior to lunch and after lunch. And actually, the two different groups actually took two different types of directions. Uh, probably the morning group was very focused on this idea of, you know, what types of questions should we be asking when it comes to uh, UDL, as well as a number of places saying we're doing UDL and we want to better understand the impact of our activities. And, and, and how should we be measuring it? Should we be measured through student outcomes? Should we be measured from what our teachers are doing? Uh, and then, of course, there's questions about, well, well what exactly are you doing in respect to UDL? Um, and then the afternoon uh, after lunch conversation dealt more with the uh, aspects of policy. And if you could further, if you could turn the, the next slide there, uh, Alex, um, you know, elements there were, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, what's taking place but also alignment to policy, as I mentioned, and policies that potentially to put into place, for example, like in the state of Maryland where we were, policies have been put into place. What, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of implementation? And then back to what types of questions should we be asking? There was also a conversation of this alignment with evidence-based practices and the UDL framework and the implications there and work actually that Kavita has uh, fostered and, and, and facilitated and, and she was a member and participating uh, there as well, and, and she'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. Um, overall, though, and we'll get to this here later on in the discussion, is this overall arching about what constitutes UDL when it comes to the intervention that needs then to be considered in respect to the research. What types of instruments to consider was a conversation. Some folks were discussing instruments that had been created. For example, uh, uh, the uh, Center for Online Learning, Center for Online Learning Students with Disabilities. We've done some work and analysis of personalized learning. And we've constructed some instruments for that. And some others were sharing that as well. And so overall, the symposium offered an element of uh, kind of foundational, some issues that people are trying to address, some conversations about individuals that were saying we're available, we're willing to do potentially uh, research, and the like. And, um, and some of that work, of course, allowed us to kind of continue as a core committee to some of the things that you'll learn about this evening, as well as some ongoing activities. And so with that, actually, I'm going to transition over to uh, Kavita on some of those additional activities. Thanks, Sean. Um, and thank you, Alex, for being our slide, um, slide progressor. Um, so what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next few minutes is a, a new tool that we're going to be putting up on the UDL IRN website, the, the research page of the website. Um, could you progress one more, Alex? So what we are working on, this is going to be up fairly soon. It, we actually have the prototype up now and it will, it'll be open to the public fairly soon. It's a research database um, with a focus on articles related to UDL research. Um, so it, the database will be searchable and it will include um, empirical studies that have quantitative or qualitative designs at, or mixed methods designs um, that are published in peer reviewed journals. We are including articles that are in pre-K through 12 settings and higher educational settings. Um, and we're also including resources related to research. So things like tools and instruments you can use, syntheses and reviews of research, and information on methodology that you can use for UDL research. Next slide. So what is this tool? The purpose of the tool, um, we wanted to bring together what's out there with the UDL research so that we can start to identify the gaps in knowledge by having kind of a body of the research together. Um, it'll also be a way to find opportunities to replicate research. So you might find a study that um, you think this is a really interesting one to do in your setting and, or in your environment that you work in. Um, it'll also be an opportunity to connect with other researchers. I think we're hoping to put, have an area on there where people can comment and uh, write to each other as well. Um, what this database is not, we are not including all the descriptive and conceptual articles that there are about UDL. There's hundreds of those and many of them are wonderful articles. But what we really wanted to do was have a tool that will focus on research studies so that as a researcher or a practitioner who is interested in doing research, you can go in here um, and see what's going on, what designs that people use, what context are they looking at um, UDL application. Next slide. So, and we've broken down the uh, research on UDL in these kind of four main categorical um, uh, ways. 
um, what we did was we looked at the current research based on UDL and we pulled out some of the main categories that came out. And I apologize, the PowerPoint slide kind of compressed some of them. But you can see that the four categories that we have in the tool are research on UDL based instructional practices. So those are a lot of the K through 12 practices and the higher ed practices where people are applying UDL right in their classrooms and their courses. Um, we found a lot of UDL research using digital environment. So we had a category for that on its own because there were so many articles on um, how digital environments can have UDL components. Um, we'll also have a category for UDL implementation. So actually research on UDL implementation. How do students feel about UDL based courses? Um, what are the professional development things going on for teacher and faculty? And also what is the research about school wide or district wide implementation? And then finally, the fourth category, um, that's the one where we have resources for researchers like the tools, um, the methodologies and the reviews and syntheses of research. Next slide. So again, as I said, it's coming soon. We have the prototype ready and the committee is just finalizing some final elements. So I think probably in the next month or two, we'll have this research database ready to go. Um, I, I forgot to say one thing that we will include in this database, if you're a researcher and you want to submit information on an article or a study that you have going, uh, you can write and we will look up the study and we'll add it to the database too. So it's kind of an interactive tool. We're happy to consider articles that are out there that we haven't put in the database. Um, so there will be a way for researchers to communicate with us about articles that are published and that can be in the database. Um, and when it's ready, I think we will be, the UDL IRN will be sending out a message to the listserv um, with the URL for the new, the new tool. Moving on. So I think this is where um, Brian Dean, if you have gotten any questions on the twi Twitter feed, uh, would you like to jump in? Yeah, hey everybody. Uh, my mind, I'm still reeling from, uh, from the idea of the research database tool. Um, and I think that Twitter is too. We're, they're a little quiet right now, um, but I think uh, they're just waiting for it to kind of sink in. So uh, it's coming, it's coming. Check back in a little bit. So one of the things is, uh, this is Sean again. One of the things that came out of the summit was uh, we, we actually shared uh, some of Kavita and some of her colleagues have put together a synthesis of the current work. And there were questions about the current work. There was uh, actually, I think, a number of questions about the limited understanding of the current work. And that was one of the drivers behind this. And, uh, and one of the things that we heard also from the summit participants um, were, was the fact that this tool, uh, to be able to engage and to understand, um, would kind of, in a way, narrow down a lot of the other um, pieces that are out there that are, as Kavita shared, excellent pieces but are not as essential to this kind of implementation then how do you measure. Um, so that's, I just wanted to kind of bring that back to the summit, which I thank those participants because it was from that, the, the, the core committee really kind of built upon, so. So Jim, this is, this is, uh, this is your transition. Yeah, and you know what, I, I was unmuted, but I, hopefully you can all hear me now. Yes. So, Sean, that was a good segue because one of the first things you, um, you mentioned was the issue of measurement with regards to the, the field of UDL. And so I'd, I'd like to open this up to, of course, to the panelists for our discussion is what are some of the issues that we see with regards to actually measuring UDL? So, how's this? I will, I will start off with one of the issues in, um, along with my colleague Sean Smith and Jamie Basham, um, we've been working on an observation instrument to measure UDL. And, and what we've found is kind of a, a, it's in the eye of the beholder. We, we went in and th this instrument, and, and I'm not really going to spend a a large amount of time talking um, about the instrument in great detail um, takes many of the checkpoints or all the checkpoints of UDL in one way or another, has rewritten them in language that we think is easier for teachers and educators to conceptualize, 
And, and we went into situations where we were doing observations across kindergarten to high school settings. And, and what we found was across um, two of the individuals who were using it, that, that one of the individual tended to have more of a kind of a liberal, absolutely rah-rah, I'm seeing elements of UDL. And then one of the other observers was, was a bit more conservative and was saying, yes, I'm seeing elements of UDL. But when we came to making comparisons, while there was continuity between both of the observers, meaning when they were in an environment where more UDL was being observed, both the observers observed more. In areas where it was more sparse, they were pretty consistent in saying it was sparse. But if we operationalize things, the numbers that these two folks had were not entirely precise. So the question is, until we norm something like this, you know, we, we may find that it's to do a research study, to observe and say there's UDL, we may need a lot of observers observing the same amount, or we're gonna have a fairly extensive amount of training so that the reliability between two raters is, is far closer than um, maybe what we originally saw. So that was one of the issues that I think we've found thus far with regards to, you might think it's easy to go in and say, I'm observing UDL, but when it comes down to it, to measure it and operationalize it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. So can we, can anyone jump in here? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> So one of the things that I struggle with, I'll just share my own research struggles, is um, the role of intentional planning with UDL. Because intentional <clears throat> planning is so very um, critical to UDL. Many of the checkpoints are based on evidence-based practices that have, have a research base that extend beyond or before the development of UDL and during the development of UDL. So it's possible um, for a teacher, for example, to be representing materials through visual supports, which would also click in as representing um, different uh, um, multiple methods of representation. And so what I see in a classroom doesn't necessarily click in for me as UDL because things can be or can't be, or I mean, can be UDL or, or may just be a teacher using good evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. What I need to see in my work is, is that intentional planning process. That's what I have come to believe is the most important piece that determines is this UDL or is this not UDL? Are teachers planning um, to reduce barriers? Are they planning for learner variability? And then the evidence of that planning comes through, of course, in many of those different strategies and methods and tools that they bring in. But I haven't seen a measurement tool out there yet that looks at that. So people who are much, much smarter than me need to develop and, and norm one of those measurement tools for the planning process. Because right now, that's what Kavita was kind of speaking to. We have lots of descriptions of things people are doing. Um, which are good descriptions. I write them myself, <laughs> but we don't necessarily have a good instrument or or way to capture that and then quantify or or uh, evaluate in that that in some way. So that would be a good thing for the field to tackle, for my mm -hmm. opinion. So Brian, do you want to jump in here? There's some activity going on on Twitter. It seems like, and you were offering some questions. Oh yeah, now I told you folks, you just gotta let it kinda kinda marinate for a little bit. You guys talk some deep stuff. So um it's alive out there now. It's like a live wire out there. So out in the UDL Twitterverse, uh we got some general questions. I'm gonna shoot them your way. Um so uh what if we're interested in, in uh what what are the 
and we'll come back to this one, but um, what are the presenters currently uh, researching? What are you guys uh, working on um, uh, and what's going on in the field? You know, you guys are starting to kind of allude to that. Um, but, but I think what uh, really speaks to this conversation and it speaks to what Elisa is, is kind of uh, is talking about it, what are the issues around measuring UDL and how is UDL measured in the field? And, and um, so how do those two kind of marry each other? How do they work with each other? And then I got a follow up from that if, if, you, uh, if you could kind of all take a stab at that and then we'll come back to the idea of what you guys currently uh, researching and working on. I'll jump in there. Um, so on the Google Doc, uh, many of us have put in what we're currently working on. And I think maybe we can take a little time to each just talk about it. And uh, that could be something that we, we discuss. Um, but I also wanted to address uh, what Jim and Elisa had just said about intentionality. And Elisa, I, that was exactly what was going through my mind as Jim was talking about measurement. So uh, we were on the same wavelength. Um, one thing that my colleague and I are doing right now with a UDL research project is looking again at that intentionality piece. So we're working with teachers to design a project that has UDL in it. Um, we're adapting an evidence-based practice uh, with UDL. But one of the things is we are actually capturing that design process. So we're looking at how is UDL being applied to goals, assessments, methods, and materials, which are the four domains that CAST has written about in, in, their, in their work. Um, so we're actually looking at working with teachers to go down to a checkpoint level. And so they, we work with them to consider how they're making uh, instruction flexible and engaging for whom that is. Uh, is it for everybody? Is it for, you know, which learners are they targeting and how are they meeting, keeping it flexible for, to um, address learner variability? So that is one way we're looking not just at observing what happens after during implementation or after the fact, but also uh, documenting the, the process of designing the project. So just wanted to throw that in. Um, I'll let somebody else speak. We've got the, the Google Doc up on screen. <clears throat> well, here, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Sean again. Uh, so some of the work I'm doing uh, involves the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. And what I'm talking about can be found on the Center on Online Learning .org, Center on onlinelearning.org. And we're focused on K-12 students, uh, particularly K-12 online learning. And uh, colleagues of mine, uh, Jeff Dietrich and Jamie Basham, uh, decided a couple of years ago to investigate this idea that people know as blended or fully online learning or personalized learning or supportive learning. And take a look at the content that is uh, driving the bus. Uh, that if many individuals, if they're participating in online learning, they're engaging in some sort of online content. And so if it's alignment to the needs of individuals with disabilities, uh, it should align with the elements, the principles of uh, universal design for learning and the framework. And so we developed a tool which is online. It's, it's there on the center's website that's available to use, free to use. And we actually have a report that was published uh, just in January this year that does an overview of the six of the most popular vendors out there and uh, the purpose is simply to take the tool uh, and the tool itself aligns with the framework, the principles and the guidelines and examine lesson content to determine whether or not there's alignment. And we structure the methodology and we uh, suggest how to potentially uh, facilitate that if someone wanted to use that tool. Our overall outcome data is there uh, online as well. So I'm not, I won't belabor that, but the skinny of it is sadly, at least of the lessons, the several thousand lessons we looked at across six uh, primarily uh, very popular vendors is that it's not aligned to UDL, the, the UDL framework. Um, I think there's a lot of other questions to be asking. I think there's some other measures to use, but it was our intent to try to understand if individuals are engaged in some sort of content online, how does it align to UDL uh, principles to potentially uh, make it more available for individuals with disabilities? So that's an example of some research going on. Jim or Lisa, do you want to share in terms of, I know your, your work is up on the Google Doc, but. Well, I think the, my earlier comments about uh, the work that, that Sean, you and I and Jamie Basham are doing is, is what I posted up there. So, um, Elisa, how about you? Sure. Um, I'm in the second year of a two-year uh, study with our pre-service teachers here at USM. Um, we have about 170 participants from last year across two semesters where we designed a study looking at uh, planning, uh, 
lesson planning and then actual implementation to see the alignment between lesson plans and implementation around UDL. We also did a um, phase change, so they began their uh, early work using traditional lesson planning. We had an intervention on UDL training and then their second eight weeks they used UDL planning. So we're, we're comparing to see if there were different outcomes in what they did. Um, we learned some things about <laughs> ways to do it better <laughs> after last year. And so we're tweaking that a bit this year and just received IRB approval to go ahead and, and move forward with all of our student teachers this year. So we're looking excited, we're getting excited about that. Um, one of the things that is, is challenging us though is, is now since UDL is, is more out there, uh, meaning that it's, it's starting to hit in textbooks, it's starting to hit in the way different uh, professors teach in pre-service teaching, uh, we, we are less able to control some of the messages that students come to us with. And so uh, some of the fogginess around UDL comes into play sometimes um, in what we're hearing back from students. This idea of how many checkpoints or the, you know, what is it actually, or UDL, is it just technology? All of these different things that we've talked about in the field for a while, are starting we're hearing those from students now which is kind of interesting so um, we're working on that um, I'm also just wrapping up a study with Dr. Hollingshead who is uh, facilitating the session tonight where we talked to some general education teachers about um, I think if you if you've ever listened to me speak you know my interest is um, students with intellectual disabilities specifically moderate to severe intellectual disabilities so we're just wrapping that up and and have it out for publication so hopefully that will be out soon Sean uh, you may want to mention another thing people could be looking forward to in terms of research do you want to talk about that or you want me to you're muted. Go ahead, go ahead, Alicia, uh, you've got the mic. So um, there is a, a special issue that I think should be coming, Sean, nod yes or no, like springtime I'm thinking is when there, yeah, <laughs> that's a really great nod there, Sean. <laughs> but uh, there's a special issue coming out in um, uh, the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Journal for AAIDD that is on uh, UDL and uh, intellectual disabilities. It is predominantly uh, studies that are being put forward in that issue. Uh, we're really excited about that. Sean and I are co-editing that issue and, and we're excited about getting some more data out there. Um, so that's exciting coming forward. Not all my work for sure, but I'm no, just happy to see work. Yeah. And Kavita is a participant in that yeah. as well. So great. yeah, exactly. As is Alex. Um, who's yes, online. exactly. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm just looking forward to more work getting out there. So those are some of the main things I'm working on. I did a huge survey nationally and it seems no one wants it. So that one of the issues is getting things published in, in UDL because general education, um, journals seem to say that's more special education and special education journals may say as as I just got back uh, not enough about special education in the piece so you know it's it's a catch-22 this UDL bridging both environments um, in terms of research so we have to make our own niche that's that's for sure so that's my work all right well I'm gonna I'm gonna switch directions now for a second because I was looking at the Google Doc and uh, Anya Evmenova, did I get that? You know, I'm, I apologize ahead of time if I didn't get it right, but I do know Anya from uh, her act. She's both uh, act, doing some activities, I think, with the UDL IRN, but also very closely aligned with the technology and media division of the Council for Exceptional Children. And of course, uh, Anya's question, I think is a, a very fundamental one for individuals doing research. And that when you're doing a intervention study, essentially trying to say that as a result of universal design for learning, we have discovered that we see some measurable outcomes that demonstrate improvement in academic areas, possibly social, cognitive areas, or whatever area that the researchers 
are trying to demonstrate that there is a functional relationship between universal design for learning and outcomes. And the question is, you know, we, we've got 31 different checkpoints that make up universal design for learning. And I don't think we have any uniform agreement in the field um, how many of those are necessary to move from, um, and I think uh, Kavita and um, Elisa both alluded to this earlier, moving from where is something that is just kind of occurring with respect to maybe traditional instructional best practice teaching methods to something that is demonstrated to be a very intentional combination of UDL checkpoints to say that you have UDL. I mean, is it, for example, do we need to have two from each of the three areas, two from representation, two from action and engagement, and two from an expression? Do we need to have a minimum of three? Or what happens if something is, is extremely heavy in checkpoints representing representation, but really there's not much in the research study or by the individuals who are studying uh, UDL, they, they don't really talk that much about expression, for example. Um, what, what, do, what do folks think? Um, I'll jump in on there on that one, Jim, just because um, one of the things with how many checkpoints that I'm, I'm kind of grappling with or looking at is really that the checkpoints should be about reducing the barriers and increasing access. Right. So how many you apply really, um, I, I'm shying away from being too prescriptive because it should be about where are the barriers in this practice for the learners you're working with and then using the checkpoints um, flexibly for those barriers. So for example, uh, my colleague and I are doing a adaptation of a self-monitoring in intervention at a school and we're applying UDL checkpoints. And after working with the teachers, we found that many of the adaptations, um, they fell under the uh, principle three checkpoints, the engagement or the old mm. principle three checkpoints of engagement. And it made sense because a lot of things about self-monitoring are, um, there were things about self-regulation and authenticity and choice. And so we realized that just naturally that particular intervention that we adapted leaned towards the engagement principle. And then we've done some work with things like repeated reading and video self-modeling and UDL. And those tend to have maybe be a little bit more heavy towards uh, representation and expression just because of what those are. So I would say that, um, I, I would lean towards maybe looking at the barrier reduction rather than it has to be two from every column or has to have something from everyone. So, so do you think what, so how would, how would you characterize, I, I guess, so if someone was doing a research study, then if we used a barriers reduction model, then that would suggest that there needs to be a very distinct and definitive discussion that identifies that in the particular study there were a variety or a number of barriers and then as part of the methodology um, showing how principles of UDL were directly applied to reducing those barriers. So maybe some of this is our, our field needs to have in any UDL section um, a, a specific section that describes exactly how the checkpoints were implemented to reduce barriers or to do what. Because I, I know back when some of the earlier articles that were trying to get published in the Journal of Special Ed Technology, that were returned to researchers were, you know, they'd say, and this study used UDL, and we had multiple means of representation, and they maybe stated one, two, or three things, and we did this, 
and we did that, but there was not a very elaborate discussion. So wh what, do, what, do, what does the panel think with regards to the possibility of having to ask the field to design kind of a protocol that's used in studies to demonstrate how UDL was intentionally integrated into that study. I think it would be very interesting as, you know, as an editor for Focus, I know, I know that we just accepted um, a study a few months ago that had a UDL section that uh, needed some improvement, I will say, but the, the methodology and the study itself were actually uh, solid and it got accepted. Um, it would be nice. I, I think it's a function that this this group through the UDL IRN could do. Maybe have some yeah. recommendations out there. I don't know that we could necessarily call it a protocol per se, although it certainly could be used yeah. in that way, Jim. Yeah, but, I'm. Yeah. I'm. I'm just. I was. I was fishing. No, um, I, I mean, I, I agree. Words. I think it'd be useful, very useful, and then people could use it for a protocol, or they could use it as a checklist of recommendations. But, I mean, Kavita's work alone um, really speaks to the idea that so many elements are missing in these studies. I mean, I know we look for studies related to individuals with intellectual disabilities, and sometimes people just don't describe their participants enough to really yeah, know... Yeah who they are and, and what that means and all of those things. So yeah, I think that'd be a good thing that this group and others who wanna work with us could contribute. I'd be curious, this is Sean, to, to hear from the group on that. You know, right. I, for, for someone who uh, has a, is a former editor, but reviews still a lot and also reviewing grants, I, I feel that there's certain communities where uh, our understanding and use of UDL um, is a little bit more mature than is reflected from what Jim, the example you offered. But I'm not sure if that's uh, I'm not sure if that's due to the individual versus what the community knows. And uh, I think that's I think that's a critical element. Uh, I think all of us have been sadly probably at presentations where we we squirm a little bit when folks describe what they did that was UDL. Um, if those are participating in professional conferences, and that's not to try to criticize others. It's more I think the nature of uh, kind of uh, the, the maturity and, and, and the growth and understanding of that. So uh, reflected in research as well. So, And it's not to say that we have some maturity that, oh, no. that others do not, because I mean, I think I learn the most when I'm talking to those folks who are implementing. So it would be really fantastic if, if people on that journey helped us figure this out. Like, how yeah. do you know when you see it? How, how do you know, when your practice has changed, you know, and um, I think we always want to, and I know you do too, Sean. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely just extending what you were oh, saying. No. And yeah. to clarify, honestly, I was just piggybacking. Yeah. No, you're right. In terms, right. Thank you very much. But, but, but your comment about the fact that um, Editors, well, yeah. we included individuals with intellectual disabilities and yet we didn't clarify. Right. This, this idea, well, we did UDL, but we're not clarifying. We're not documenting. We're not, you know, really, you know, building that up. And that's, I think that's a, that's critical. It helps us further define. So, yeah, yeah. I also think we need to think about who would use this recommendation. You know, to whom? Because we're having such trouble with the getting it across from special education to general education and publication. So, how do we do that better? And maybe others have ideas. Brian, what's happening out there in the Twitter world? It is explosive out here. There's a ton of questions. Um, first, first and foremost, people are, are um, super excited about the doc and they want to know how to get back into that. Um, so if you guys could plug that one more time um, or, or pull up the, uh, the address so that they can add some of their own thoughts. Um, and then uh, they're, they're, they're really excited about this database tool. I mean, uh, uh, we're getting a lot of retweets on it. Um, so, and they're asking when, 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 when. So uh, if you guys could also... Uh, give us a time frame on that. I know that uh, you kept it a little, little uh, a secret, um, <clears throat> a little secretive in saying soon, um, but they're, they're knocking down the Twitter doors asking when. Um, and then we got some questions around pre-service teachers. So I'll let you answer those two and then come back to me and I got some for pre about pre-service teachers and what that means. So Alex, if you could post that URL again. And Kavita, do you want to talk about the uh, tool or do you want me sure. to? 
Sure. Well, actually, Sean, you can jump in. We are very close. I think we're 95% there. We have the prototype ready to go. Uh, the last thing we need to do, the committee is just doing some final kind of, we're writing some of the text around the tool, finishing things up. So I think, Sean, we'll probably approve it around um, October and maybe have it live. I'm thinking November, but I'm looking at Sean because he's our, our chair. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, uh, <laughs> folks out there, uh, this has been a, a collaborative process and, uh, the uh, core group wants to give some feedback to what's been uh, put out as a shell. And yes, I think that timeline sounds perfect. And, and, and our other Brian, who's not with us today, uh, Wojcik has been uh, instrumental in, in that development. We want to thank him for all his hard work. Sean, a question. Do you know, uh, will, everybody, uh, it, will everybody on the UDL IR list, we can send out an email when the tool is up and all these folks on this um, Hangout will get it. Is that correct? Sure, and, and I believe I know one conversation I had with uh, some of the the board was that they would uh, uh, there would be a nice launch for it um, okay. off the website. So I imagine they'll they'll make it very visual there. So and Alex, if you could put us back to the uh, that Bitly so folks can see that, that would be perfect. Thanks so much. We've got it in the text box as well in the chat. Oh, box. Yeah, and we do. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. The people can find can go straight to it from there. Yep, and it's uh, it's all over. It's been retweeted several times. So, uh, like I said, uh, you know that uh, research, uh, the research doc, and it being collaborative, that's on fire right now. Um, some people had some questions around pre-service teachers uh, that I thought were pretty interesting. Um, I'm trying to find them up in our our uh, uh, chat box here. But uh, are we prepared? Here's a big question: Are we preparing teachers to implement UDL at the pre-service level? Um, uh, and then to follow up on that, will we train? Um, uh, will we train to measure the capacity if they are not in the CEC teacher education standards? And I think that kind of goes back to uh, what Elisa was talking about between this this bridge between these two places and and what's that uh, <coughs> ed and special ed and and not enough of this and and too much of that. Um, so um, how are we going to? Or do you have any ideas around how to train and measure the capacity? Lisa, I'm putting a couple of, well, I'm putting some things in the chat box. I mean, I don't think UDL has to be uh, mentioned specifically in the CEC standards. Certainly, diversity of learners standard six, it addresses, it addresses standard one, the variability of learners and, and um, planning for learner differences. There are ways to web it all in, just like with evidence-based practices, we don't expect a specific strategy to be mentioned in the standards either. Those standards are global, and so UDL as a framework can be one of the ways that we address some of those things within the CEC standards. Um, I think it's important to note that CEC this year has a whole strand on universal design for learning in April, so obviously uh, CEC is, um, I don't know if I should say on board, but but certainly they are making a space for UDL within their conference. And um, but again, that we we run into that challenge of then does that make us about special education when we when we really are not all about special education? So I don't think the CEC standards are are really where we have the issue. I think the bigger issue is pushing us into general education teacher education. Uh, um, I think a lot of special educators are now addressing UDL in their pre-service teacher education programs. In fact, there's, there are um, publications on that, not a plethora. There's not a plethora of publications on anything um, related to UDL. But uh, I think, for Lisa, me anyway, Jenna Can I ask a quick question? Can I this be is, quiet? Is that what no, you're no, going to no, ask? No, this is, this is Sean. I'm, I'm just yeah. curious. From, uh, and this is, goes along with the, uh, the work in the online center. Well, what we've realized with the online center is that elements that are critical for teacher development to teach in an online environment, blended or fully online, uh, a lot of that's not being addressed, at least what national work is showing. And some of the argument is due to the fact that it's not integrated into standards. And while um, CEC does make reference to learning differences, I'm just curious, I mean, are there conversations being had at the level of CEC or, or other entities where UDL now is part of ESSA and others, um, it needs to be, you know, a, 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 an identified standard, therefore, to then be followed, then to be integrated, to be measured, et cetera. Uh, that's just some of the conversation with the online center and other work is that if it's not there, folks, you know, we don't have to do it because it's not something we have to measure, et cetera. 
I don't know that answer. Um, okay. I know that UDL is, they have a strand for UDL this year. I know that it's something that they're paying very close attention to, but I don't know that, I mean, it'd be very much like the law, Sean, because the, you know, the law actually says UDL or basically UDL like <laughs> frameworks, you know? So I think they're going to, um, my guess would be maybe somebody on knows that, but my guess would be just like with standards, they're going to stay pretty generic. So that we could address it through the standards, but we're not forced to, if that makes sense. But at the same time, if in the next reauthorization of IDEA um, and whatever they do with every student succeeds, if UDL is elevated to e an even higher status in the standards, then whether or not CEC includes it. Um, one can argue there's an obligation of all teacher preparation institutions that they need to adequately prepare their teachers to implement UDL because at some point um, schools may be held accountable if or if not they are actually doing UDL. Well, thanks, Brian, for, yeah, yeah. for sharing. Jim, do you, do you want to yeah. facilitate? Okay. So um, what about, and this is now from a different um, direction, and uh, my, my sense is, Kavita, you'll, you'll have a sense from your, your literature reviews. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have maybe four essential um, models for, for thinking about research in the field. And one is uh, in no particular order of importance, uh, we would say single subject research or small end research. We have um, you know, uh, large group studies and more quantitative sort of methodologies and large group studies. Um, we have qualitative research, and then in some cases, case study research. Um, what, what does the panel think with regards to going beyond, we probably need to have uh, elements of all four of those, those research models contributing to the field. Um, which ones are, do, do we think are, are easier to do? What are some of the challenges for doing some of these? And, and where might we see the next five years with regards to um, a variety of methodologies to, um, to, to measure and determine the effectiveness of UDL? Well, I'll speak briefly. I'm sure Kavita is going to jump in. I hope she will. But I think just in my own work and, and what I'm getting, um, like I said, we just had that, that huge national study that was put out twice now. <laughs> and um, and, and feedback, uh, both from a, a general uh, education journal and from a special education journal, the questions that we're getting from those editors have to do with the effectiveness of UDL. They want us to talk about outcomes mm -hmm. um and there there isn't a lot out there about outcomes so <laughs> i mean from my perspective the biggest gap we have description about how much people liked mm -hmm. it and how you know it changed some things for some kids in testimonial but i i really believe the biggest gap is is quantitative outcomes showing mm -hmm. a difference that's what i but that's not mm -hmm. the kind of research i do so i need others help And I'll jump in. I'm, I think my, my mic is unmuted. Um, so we just had another review published in Exceptionality. It should be coming out in a, in a, um, 
one of the upcoming issues. Uh, this was the same group that did the, our original review with one additional person who helped us kind of do a um, synthesis across effect sizes of the studies. And I was just pulling that up as Elisa was talking to see if I could count quickly what was what. Um, in that study, we just looked at pre-K through 12 and we looked at the designs. And I think there were actually, there were a couple of single subject and there were several quasi-experimental um, kind of small quantitative studies and a few case studies as far as designs. And I think what happens is the designs kind of emerge from the scale of the study. So there were some people in like an FSC setting, a fully self-contained setting, working with just a few individuals. Those were single subject. Right. Uh, there were some people using a digital environment and they were comparing two groups of students using a digital environment and they were able to do a quasi-experimental, more quantitative study. Um, but it, because they were looking at a digital tool. And then there were others, the case studies were more looking at how do you apply UDL at a lesson level and how do, what are the outcomes and perceptions of students. So I wonder if those methodologies will emerge from the levels that people are looking at. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's, the, that's just, the, I'll leave it at that question. It's going to, there are all these different levels depending on where you're looking at your level of implementation, what tools you're using. So one of the things that the, the panel wanted to um, discuss and also take some input from the, the Google Docs instrument is, is essentially talking about what's our next step with regards to um, what we're going to do at the upcoming UDL IRN Summit. So, for example, um, I'm seeing Sue Harden has suggested that we have a networking session where researchers and practitioners can discuss ideas for future research. So, uh, what does the panel think? Uh, I, I certainly feel uh, it might be interesting to try to see if we can have um, uh, either a large uh, a session or, or maybe a series of roundtables or something where maybe we have researchers doing face-to-face. -face. But if we have some researchers who can't necessarily physically be there, maybe we can see if we can have them come in to beam in electronically and, and participate in some form. I'd like us to move to a more product oriented um, okay. uh, research session in that I think for the last couple of years, we've talked a lot about ideas and what people want to do. If there's a way for us to um, network with people prior to the session, maybe we can have, you know, what, what Brian likes to call design labs and actually mm -hmm. finish with some sort of product, like an outcome or a, you know, just a, I mean, a, an outline or a, a a proposal or whatever, but to actually move one step forward instead of just having great, because I've always had great conversations with people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those end in things, sometimes not. That's my suggestion, more product oriented. And, and this is Sean. I'd love to hear your feedback along those lines because one of the considerations the core is, uh, the, the research core committee has put forward uh, has been a kind of a structure where uh, a session towards the end of the first day with a follow-up the next morning. It's a little bit more informal, but to some of the elements that Lisa just shared. Um, so trying to structure it to allow for that interaction. Um, so it's, it's, it's within the construct of a session, but also then potentially the follow-up actually during the breakfast, breakfast time for some of those discussions to kind of be cemented. So um, other feedback would be very helpful via the Twitter or, or chat or emails or, or whatever, uh, as well as on the Google Doc on um, how to potentially facilitate whatever topic we do tend to consider. So, Got some questions around uh, doing maybe a pre-conference on research and development, um, which I think, them, you know, mm -hmm. you might get people knocking down your doors. Yeah, you know, and, and another thing with regards to that, kind of uh, bridging from what Sean and Elisa have said is, you know, there is this, this term network in, in our group and maybe there might be a way to actually try to do some 
some networking at the summit that kicks off a national or an international research project, one or two. And maybe the possibility of, of if we can have two or three potential research product, project, projects um, and, and use the summit as a way to network to have participants go back and say to their directors of special ed or to their, to their principals or their superintendents, we were at this summit and they want to do uh, such and such a study where they would need to come in and do an observation in a classroom for 30 minutes and or um, <clears throat> If our district could nominate 10 or 15 teachers that we know that we think are doing uh, UDL, we would like to uh, see if we can um, link them up with some researchers who want to do some interviews of them. Um, you know, I, I'm just wondering if, if we tried to be more aggressive with trying to use this networking to, to build a coalition, we might find ourselves able to broaden out and get a much larger end than we might normally do if we were, if someone was trying to do a research study in their home community or their local education agency or state. And I hate to end this wonderful conversation, but we have just a couple more minutes left to wrap it up. So um, I'm not sure if you, the presenters, want to take a final question from Brian from Twitter or, or what, but I'm just giving you a heads up. Brian? Well, oh, there's so many, there's so many good ones. Uh, it's hard to... It was hard to find just one. Um, now you got a lot of people uh, excited about this uh, idea of a pre-conference or, or uh, some are suggesting a full half-day conference. Are you guys up for that? You ready for that? Ready to go? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, Awkward we'd love pause. To hear, well, so, some concerted time to be able to get a group together. Uh, and I think as Elisa, I just want to piggyback on Elisa, that we actually would focus and and come out with some very strategic uh, next steps, I think would be, uh, would be great, but facilitating it within a, a half day as uh, Jamie's offering or a pre-conference, I think is, is something to explore. I, all I wanna share is that Google Doc will stay there, and if you guys wanna get specific on some of those ideas, we, we'd welcome that, that'd be phenomenal. Are you guys, uh, you guys were showing it on the, on the shared screen. Um, uh, is, that, is that doc starting to fill up? It looks like you had quite a few people in there typing. Yeah, I think it is filling up. And I'm seeing in the chat box that people like not necessarily a pre-conference, but something during or post, because some ideas are going to be coming up. So people, I think I'm reading that people like the idea of a, a half day or a several hour session sometime during towards the end of the conference. I hope I'm well, that, it correctly. Yeah, that, that, there's a lot of conversation too floating around on Twitter about uh, bringing practitioners and researchers together and making that handshake happen mm -hmm. yeah. um, and how powerful that could be. So um, I, I want to reach out uh, and speak on, on behalf of my UDL fam and the, and the UDL tweets out there and, and say well, we really appreciate you guys coming and um, kind of showing us what the future of uh, UDL research is going to look like. You guys, the research crew is, is making it happen. That's right. <laughs> and... Um you heard the, the committee mentioned the summit multiple times. So if you haven't heard about it before, um, the 2017 UDL summit, UDL-IRN summit is on March 30th and to 31st in Orlando, Florida. I look forward to that. I know March in uh, Idaho is not as nice as Orlando is going to be. So all those great conversations uh, while being in Orlando might be pretty nice. Um, the call for proposals is extended until uh, September 23rd. So if you're in, interested in presenting during the summit, please submit your proposal. Um, you can find all of the information that you need for that on our website, udlirn.org. And um, if you enjoyed today's session, uh, we have another great one coming up in October. On October 19th, we'll have a unique session with the founder of UDL, uh, Dr. David Rose from CAST. 
And the session is titled Ask Me Anything. So I know Brian Dean is planning on asking David Rose about his favorite cereal, for example. Ooh, if, um, no, it's, it's, if he was a cereal, what cereal would he be? Oh, that's right. That's right. And you can't say Wheaties because it's the breakfast of champions. You got to come up with something else. Fruit Loops. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways um to sign up for that session you also go to our website udlirn.org slash hangout and you will be receiving email with a link to connect similar to tonight uh, the recording will be of the session will be posted uh, shortly on our website so if you missed part of our conversation tonight or if you know of colleagues that might benefit from listening to it uh, please check it out uh, in just a couple days and uh, don't miss UDL chat that happens every first and third Wednesday of the month on Twitter. And thank you all. Thank you with the panelists for participating and taking your time to share uh, with us everything that's new about research on UDL. Thank you participants for all your questions. Thank you people on Twitter. Thank you Brian Dean for following Twitter and everyone have a great night. Thank you, Alex. Bye everyone. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.